All right, welcome to episode number three of The Drive. This is the birthday edition, because tomorrow's my birthday. I'll be uh, double nickel tomorrow, so for me. Um, I wanted to talk about the evolution of fat as a filler in my clinical practice. So I started training in 1996 for all of you folks. Um, I did general surgery training because I was going to be a heart surgeon. Initially, um, you work tons of hours and uh, in our program, after the first two years, you went and did a research year. This could be in a variety of labs around the campus where I trained uh, at the Indiana University Medical Center. Uh, I ended up working in the vascular lab, but I also ended up <clears throat> part-time assisting and helping out a clinical project on leptins. So you look up leptins. There's a nice paper in my resume about leptins. So I would take fat uh, from patients' abdomens under local anesthesia and then um, from that harvest, they would do leptin research on that. So that was done under local. So I was doing liposuction on these patients under local. And I, I want to say it started in um, 97, 98. The evolution of that throughout my general surgery training, um, fat was more... Uh, or less encountered in the operating room, taking out visceral fat of patients who were having other surgeries and really not what I do now in plastic surgery, which is uh, removal and then repurposing the fat in transfers for holistic transformations or rejuvenations of breast uh, sachet volume. So in plastic surgery, you're obviously taking fat out uh, for body contouring and then fat transfers became more and more vogue as a technique to return volume back and that certainly uh, was was beginning in the late 90s early 2000s and then for the first really the first uh, 10 years uh, in the 2000s, there was a ton of work and research done looking at oh, spinning the fat and what was the, the right uh, amount of pressure to use to obtain the fat and what were the uh, size cannulas used to obtain the fat. And just a ton, a ton of work was being done most of it was being done by uh, Roger uh, Curry out of Miami. I went and took his course. Um, he was also a guest lecturer uh, when I was uh, teaching. And um, I mean, we used fat all the time. So I would do 100 to 200 fat transfers a year for my cancer patients. So for everyone, uh, a cancer patient would need a fat transfer after a mastectomy and reconstruction. In many instances, to provide, uh, to provide better volume in a uh, autologous fat transfer, like a DIEP free flap fat transfer, or if someone had had an expander implant reconstruction, it would be important to uh, typically contour it better, meaning they may have a upper pole uh, step off, they may have a ripple, they may have some contour issue that just makes their reconstruction um, not as aesthetic, not as smooth uh, for them as they would like. And once again, these are, uh, the majority of these are in cancer patients in my practice, because that's what I did predominantly for 20 years was cancer reconstruction. And uh, 
one of the years, um, certainly in the 2000, probably uh, 2012 to 2015 time frame, I had to give a talk regarding the concerns over cancer recurrence and my specialty talk was given about sarcoma recurrence so when we're doing fat transfers especially in cancer patients I wasn't doing them in lumpectomy patients typically um, what we would do is after mastectomy so I was not concerned about fat transfers after mastectomy in my reconstruction uh, cases. The uh, stem cells transferred in the stromal vascular fraction basically are the adipose derived stem cells and the vascular cells, periocytes, and other cells that are transferred in just a, a regular transfer without any centrifugation or any spinning. Um, similarly, our adipose derived stem cells, uh, the cell type specifically is mesenchymal stem cells. So those cells, um, they're going to differentiate into fat, obviously, bone, muscle, cartilage. Um, they're not going to differentiate into breast cancer cells. So I gave the talk about not breast cancer recurrence, but then what would happen if you put it in a sarcoma defect and that would be something I would never do based on the cell type because tumors of muscle bone fat uh, tendon those are the cell types that could develop from a uh, fat transfer from the mesenchymal stem cells in a fat transfer so I would not use those uh, for those clients ever those patients uh, understood that. I explained it to them. They they totally knew why I wouldn't do that. For those patients with those types of problems, I would do a um, flap reconstruction typically, depending on where. Um, one of the first patients had a very, very large defect from their uh, knee bone to almost down to their ankle. And I had to cover that with a, a large free flap that I took from the thigh so that everybody understands what a free flap is. Um, it's a tissue composite, so it has to have skin, usually obviously skin fat. Sometimes it contains muscle, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it contains a thin uh, layer of white material called the fascia. Um, so it's either skin and fat, um, skin fat, uh, fascia, skin fat, fascia muscle. Um, you can also add bone to it. So there's fascia and um, uh, bone flaps, of course. We would use those to reconstruct these defects um, to really close the skin barrier when large tumor resections were done. So whether the, the defect uh, was a sarcoma defect dictated, you know, whether I would do a fat transfer on it. So my sarcoma patients, um, I would not do any reconstruction on those with fat. In my breast cancer patients, I was always doing reconstruction on those patients um, and then using fat transfer as a secondary procedure once or twice to go ahead and restore volume. It was very hard in those patients because they were on um, a lot of therapeutics like uh, chemotherapy, uh, estrogen blockers. Those are those are the hardest patients to go ahead and and treat and get a fat transfer result. But we still were able to get good results in those patients. So now fast forward, I'm doing explants, and we're doing a number of fat transfers on patients after uh, explant. That all started not when I started doing explant seven years ago at this point, almost eight years ago, but it actually started by a patient who came to me. She just wanted her implants removed 
and um, she knew a cancer patient of mine and she said you did my friend's fat transfer why won't you do mine and um, she did not have the signs and symptoms of uh, what's termed breast implant illness so at that point I didn't have any real specific reasons that I could you know not provide a fat transfer for her so that's one of my holistic transformations with fat and when I do and contour the abdomen and around her thighs um, I do it for uh, for patients as a rejuvenative procedure especially after having children it's called a holistic mommy makeover but in this case we're actually going to take down the previous implant um, augmentation and so depending on the numbers of surgeries some people had a lot of different surgeries and it seems like lately I've had a number of those cases uh, in my practice where more than uh, one procedure has been performed and so anytime you do more than one procedure uh, certainly we know from oncology reconstruction the more surgeries you have, the more infections you can have, the more complications uh, develop um, over time in that population. That's just, that's been known for a long period of time. So when we weren't doing a implant-based reconstruction, we knew the patients, if we did everything uh, properly with the tissue reconstruction, they would have less surgery over time. And so that was really my specialty. I did become very adept at taking care of problems, um, so I was referred people to convert implant-based reconstructions to tissue reconstructions. So back to the patient who wanted the fat transfer, I had already stopped using drains in my practice uh, because I was doing um, fat transfers, um, and then uh, I, I really drains are such a problem when you're doing explants and body contouring because you've got patients in different garments and different wraps and it's just a lot to deal with so we started doing fat transfers the issues with fat transfers and explants um vary but uh some of them will make sense because Anybody who initially got a fat transfer got, I'm sorry, anybody who initially got a breast augmentation got it because they didn't have a lot of tissue volume to begin with. So uh, some people gain tissue volume over time. As we age, our fatty layer will thicken. That occurs on the breast, just like all over the body. And it, it will allow me to do a more efficient fat transfer because that layer's thicker. So the fat goes between the skin and the breast and that is the correct layer to place the fat into. The issue then becomes how much fat can you place strategically to help the patient, you know, revolumize the breast. And so when I'm putting it back, I think of it as an upper two thirds and a lower third. The upper two thirds has the most volume. So if you just draw a horizontal line across the nipple complex and divide the, the breast into an upper two thirds and the lower two thirds, the upper two thirds always obviously has more um, opportunity to fat transfer because that is a greater amount of, of tissue and area to work with. The lower third is typically stretched out either through having the implants, having other surgeries. It's a lot uh, less tissue to work with to put fat into in, in the uh, explant situation. If it's a situation where somebody's having a fat transfer or breast augmentation, which is totally different, that tissue is not thinned out and then you can use it more effectively to expand the breast and, and add more volume to the breast. <laughs> so, started doing you know, more and more fat transfers. And now, you know, many people come to Austin and stay, you know, seven to 10 days. And the reason they're, they're coming 
is they want to have a simultaneous fat transfer. And so I get asked, well, what about toxins and everything? So I, I did several shows recently about this. So the we all get faced with uh, exposures and the, the goal for our uh, patients, we're trying to get them in better balance because they're going to continue to have toxicity. We all get exposed all the time. I'm no different. Air we breathe, fluid we drink, uh, foods we eat, uh, products we use, uh, places we travel to. We're going to get exposures no matter what. That, that's, that's not going to stop. It's trying to get our bodies to work more efficiently given our genetic capability and those exposures, like I mentioned, to be balanced out. So certainly, I'm never going to completely detoxify someone prior to any procedure or after any procedure. Um, I continue to see patients for the year um, after I operate, and then I have a detox team that works with them for a whole year. So there's lots of opportunities for healing, and we start that as soon as um, we can meet with a client and understand you know, from their interview and listen to them and hear their story. Uh, in, in fact, yesterday I met someone who's definitely got a lot of toxicity <clears throat> asymmetry was the reason they got an augmentation and so now fast forward they've gained you know 30 pounds they have lots of muscle and joint pain lots of fatigue they sound like they've gotten a uh, exposure of mold and or environmental toxins based on where they grew up so really you know that that client's going to need a lot of work they're going to have to do detox pre-op. They're going to have to continue to do it post-op. Got to get their liver working more efficiently. And um, I told them that it'd be better, they'd be better suited to have a fat transfer later. Depending on their tox burden tests and their uh, ability to detox genetically, uh, many times we are doing uh, a, a prep of detox, then an explant fat transfer with or without a lift, and then continue more detox afterwards. So, fat transfers are a very powerful tool in my hands and we're going to continue to do them.